Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter, along with Kathy. Hey. For Ask a Crafter number 39. 39. Oh my gosh, one away We're from 40. We're almost 40. Oh my gosh, and next week will actually be the uh, the last Ask a Crafter until fall. So make sure you get your questions in um, in the comments, either on the blog or under the video, if you want to have your uh, question answered, or you'll just have to, I don't know, go to the Facebook page and like us on yeah. Facebook, and then you can keep in touch with us all summer with your crafty conundrums, and we'll... Uh, <laughs> we'll answer you. That'll work, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have Fan of the Week, Pat Hathaway Yay. this week. Congratulations, Yay, Pat. Pat. Pat is great. She's always leaving wonderful comments on the Facebook page. So um, that's a great thing about Facebook. If you have a question or you just want to know if anybody else is up crafting or being creative, right. you can post it and, you know, you can carry on a conversation that way. Always some kind of connection. Yeah, and there's and always someone never, there. Never alone. Yeah. 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 Nice. All right. What do we have for questions this week, Kat? Um... I, first, I have to say a quick shout out to my my baby boy, who's my oldest, but is 15 today. Happy birthday, Gabe! Yay! Um, Linda Kenny is wondering if you could clarify something around 4:05 on Ask a Crafter 38. That's four minutes five five seconds. You answered the question about using markers on stretch canvas. It sounded to me like you said water-based markers will just wash away. Maybe I misunderstood something, but were you referring to markers on a garment that would be cleaned? If not, could you please clear that up and what materials would wash away the marks made with the markers? Thanks. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, the stretch canvas would be a canvas that's on stretcher bars that has um, uh, gesso on it or an acrylic primer. So if you colored over that with uh, markers, you know, just like your water-based markers, then, I mean, if you touched it, it would come off on your hands. It would just kind of beat up there, kind of like if you tried to write with uh, a regular marker, like a Crayola marker on a piece of plastic, you just wipe it right off. So it's not, I know you won't be putting your artwork out in the rain or in the shower or anything, it's just that anything or anything you brushed over that would just lift up that marker. So that's what I meant about washing it away. Not that it was a garment or anything, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't dry basically on the stru uh, stretch canvas. Okay. Um, Joanne recently bought a big kick die cut machine and she is looking for ways to organize her dies and embossing folders, any ideas? Yes, I have several ideas. Uh, my favorite, actually, this is because I don't have very many of the uh, the thin dies. So my thin dies are in a uh, Dollar Tree 6x6 photo album. I just have little pieces of magnet, little magnet sheets in there. And, uh, oops, it's upside down. I dump them all. Um, but that holds them in there in place really well. And I can flip through and see what I have. I also use a tea box, which if you ever, like, get a gift set of tea or anything, I have my little tiny dies, my little 2x2 two two sizzlet and little tiny embossing folders in there that is easy to flip through as well. Those aren't as popular now as they used to be, but no, you don't see um, but they're great if you, you know, sometimes you can get them for a steal too because they're not as, they're not as popular anymore. Um, and then my big embossing folders, I have in this wine crate. It's a, it was a divided wine crate, and so I can keep my texture plates, my embossing folders, extra cutting pads, um, everything right there, and again, I can flip through it. So for me, I want to have my supplies accessible, easy to find, easy to see, so that way I know what I have and I don't buy duplicates usually. We, I think we've both been guilty of a few double embossing folders, and luckily though, we'll just give it to each other. Oops, I just dumped it on the floor. Oh well, this goes up later. But as long as I can, I can get to it and see it. Then, uh, then that's good. And I have, a, I found a CD case at a yard sale that I have all my steel rule uh, dies stacked up in. Nothing fancy, but it works, and I can see everything. And that's the uh, the most important thing I think when you're storing your craft supplies. Yeah, my embossing folders um, I just have in like the the cheap shoe box, steel mm -hmm. light shoe box, oh, yeah. without the cover on it, stacked up again, basically yeah. like that, so I can flip through them. Yeah, yeah, look around. I'm sure you have something, some sort of box that's sturdy enough that you can use. Okay, Melissa wants to know your thoughts on the envelope punch board. Um, well, I tried one out last year at the uh, Heirloom Stamp Show, which we're going to next, this, this weekend. Wow, yeah, we're excited. And I can't wait. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, the one I tried out had been used all weekend by hundreds of people, and I don't think the paper that they had out there for us to use was the best, so I wasn't impressed with it, but I've heard nothing but good stuff about it, so um, I have so many different ways to make envelopes that um, I don't know if I'll be getting one, because I have my Rip and Flip create lope templates, which are my favorite, and then I've got the Crafter's Companion Envelope Box template, which makes flat envelopes or thick dimensional envelopes. Um, there's so many good templates out there. If you don't have one yet, I, I'm sure it's great. Do you have one? Uh, I do. Yeah. And I, I haven't used it that much, um, but I did try, uh, I don't know if you've seen, there's lots of different things that they're doing with them because they're making mm -hmm. the little folder tabs and they're making the little bow notches and making mm -hmm. bows and I tried yeah. some of those. It was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. I, I liked it. It was 
the convenience of having the punches is both right there. Mm-hmm. And, and like I said, people have just gone crazy engineering stuff to, to make with it. Yeah, and that's one thing I don't like about my cradle lopes is that, because you can just like rip and flip and put your card in, but I like to cut out the little notches at the top so it makes the yeah. things easier to slide in. So yeah, that punch would be totally sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and let's see, Petrina Beads, what is floating medium? Where can it be found or can it be made frugally? What inks, paints, pens, other medium can be used on a stamp and which ones cannot? How can stamps and stencils be well cleaned? Okay. Three questions. There. Yes. Uh, for floating medium, um, probably your most economical place will be at the craft store in with the two ounce bottles of craft paint, um, Americana, Delta Ceram Coat, Folk Art. They all should sell their own brand of floating medium. And it's just almost like a glazing medium that helps you do side loading. Mm-hmm. Um, and how to clean stents. Oh, did she also ask what can um, be used on stamps? What, what inks, paints, pens? other mediums can be used on stamps which cannot oh um okay well some people will use alcohol markers on stamps these would be like these guys here um they'll use them right on the rubber and then they will spritz it with like alcohol and stuff. i don't like that idea i really don't put alcohol on my stamps because it dries out the rubber so you can do it i don't recommend doing it but some people do if you do it wash your stamps good and put some glycerin on it to moisturize it again um what i do like to use is the water-based markers on your um on your rubber because then um, every water-based marker you have is like having a different color stamp pad. Yep. And so that's a great, a frugal, economical way to get going in stamping. So you don't have to buy a ton of stuff. You can get a waterproof black ink pad, you can get a set of markers, and really you can do a lot before you have to buy anything else. Um, you can use acrylic paint with like a makeup sponge, just kind of get a little bit on the sponge and dab it off so it's not globby, and then just tap it on the surface of your stamp and stamp with that. Um, I wouldn't use oil paints because oil will rot rubber. So, you know, I'd st- and it would take forever to dry. So I would stick with, um, with acrylic paints. And then, of course, you have your stamping inks. Um, and if the price is too prohibitive of, like, going out and buying a bunch of stamping inks, they have tiny little, they have sets. They have all the big, all the really popular big stamp companies, ink pad companies, make smaller pads. They're about a dollar a piece. So they are much more affordable to get going on it. And you can always re-ink them. You don't have to throw them away. They'll just dry out a little bit faster. But you could see what ones you'd actually use a lot. So, um, so that's what my recommendations for that would be. Do you have anything to add on that? Um, just like the... You know, like you did the other day, Mod, Mod Podge to do Mod like Pod, the yep. resist or yep. a glue for like a resist yep. or to even, you know, glue and then sprinkle glitter. Oh, yeah. Or, yep, absolutely. Or your, yeah, put the glue on the stamp and stamp that it. And, and the embossing, like embossing ink yep. as well mm. to, to do the yep. dust with the sparkly stuff. Yeah, and you can use in glycerin instead of um, embossing ink too. Right. So another thing for glycerin. <laughs> and how to clean stencils. I'm not and great. Stamps too. And stamps. Oh, how to clean stamps and stencils. All right, I like for rubber stamps, I really like Simple Green, especially if you have stained stamps. Um, or baby shampoo. You can use baby shampoo to clean it and a toothbrush. That will do really well. Um, just try not to get the cushion. If it's a rubber stamp with a cushion on wood on a wood uh, block, try not to get the wa- water on the wood in the rubber on the uh, cushion. Because it might separate yeah, it. It's not kind of a, you know, sticking in the water and letting it soak yeah. for a couple hours yeah. thing. You just you can with your clear stamps, so you can plop oh, yeah. those right in the sink. Let them soak, it, you know, because uh, washing them with like dish detergent or baby shampoo will make them stickier too, so they'll work with your blocks better. Um, as for stencils, I um, have a, take a big old towel, I lay it on the floor, and when I'm done, I just set my stencils down there, give them a, sp- a squirt of uh, water, and then just kind of wipe them down. If it's acrylic paint, I just let it dry. I don't unless it's filling in the holes in my stencil. I don't worry about acrylic paint. I do, the ink I always clean off because next time I use it, if I don't, it's going to reactivate and it's going to make a mess of, it's going to muddy up whatever colors I'm using. Yeah, so. And I think you've said before, like with your paper stencils, that the, the paint that dries on it kind of makes the stencil sturdier. Makes it play yeah, up. Plastic coats it. Yeah. It makes, it makes it a little, better. a little thicker. So you might mm-hmm. be able to get a better mm-hmm. stencil. So. Yep. And I'm just lazy. This is what it boils down to. I mean, come on. <laughs> now the like stays on ink. That's an alcohol base, mm-hmm. right? So, but so you're not necessarily recommending not to get that or use that but no, you want to clean it but as far as like really yeah. getting into the alcohol markers yeah it wouldn't really bother yeah and it still it wouldn't hurt after you clean like and stays on cleaners like an alcohol based cleaner i think so it still wouldn't hurt after you clean it um to to uh, wipe it off and then clean it with something gentle like baby shampoo or just tap on or some glycerin, glycerin or something yeah. to moisturize it because you don't that's how stamps get ruined um it's just they, they dry out we don't have so much of a problem here in maine but yeah. you have places that Dryer are really arid. Yeah. To yeah. kind of periodically do that anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
Kristen Gully says that she is a beginner crafter in what she calls the collecting phase. <laughs> I'm permanently in the collecting phase. She has purchased all the stuff I have demonstrated in tutorials. Oh, I, meaning Lindsay, in <laughs> tutorials, but feels overwhelmed at where to start. Any advice? Yes, I would... Um... I would find, like, I would say, okay, to this week I'm going to play with my alcohol markers and stamps. So maybe take your stamps, stamp out a few images with memento ink or some ink that's not going to react with the alcohol markers, and spend that week coloring with your alcohol markers. Next week, say, okay, today, this week I'm going to use watercolor crayons. And just give yourself a few days to really play with a limited amount of supplies, because I think you sound a little overwhelmed with all the stash you've collected over the years. So... Um, limit your supplies. You'll be you'll be surprised at how creative you'll be with a limited amount of supplies. Mm -hmm. If I have uh, something I'm, I really want to use but I've been neglecting, I'll take that supply to a crop and just that and a, you know whatever else I need for my pages or whatever, and I'll just play with that and I'll force myself to use that for eight hours in a row. I'll be just using that supply, and you really will get to know it, and you'll be surprised at how much you can do with limited supplies. You'll be more creative with limited supplies. It's it's really um, it's interesting how that works, but just. Maybe put everything in a basket, take it upstairs, take it to the kitchen table, and don't let yourself go back to your you know, storage right. area and yep. just work with that. And when, once you've done that over a period of a few weeks and you've mm -hmm. played with all the different things, you'll start to figure out how to use them together. Yeah, yeah. And you won't feel so guilty. You're probably feeling a little guilty, too, that you've collected stuff and you haven't used it. And... What? What's guilt? Yeah, nah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do. I feel guilty if I buy something and I haven't used it. You know, it's been sitting on the shelf and... So you can, and, and you get over that too precious to use or too precious to, you know, you don't want to, you know, waste it or anything. You'll get over that, so. Okay, Kim Bear wants to know the difference between pan pastels and regular pastels. Pan pastels are a very, very soft um, chalk that's in a little, like a little, almost like a makeup compact. I was just going to say, yeah. is it kind of, it's kind of like blush. Like yes. it really. Yeah, it's very soft and very similar to eyeshadow. You you can apply it um, with like little Q-tips or they come, they have uh, sponges and tools that you can use to apply it. Whereas with a, a pastel, chalk pastel stick, you'd be drawing with the stick and then maybe blending with your fingers or a tool. Um, so that's a big difference. They're super, super soft and uh, you would use a tool to apply them. They're a lot of fun too. I have done a few tutorials with them and I plan some more coming up because that's another precious supply that needs to get off the shelf and on to my table. Astrid F. wonders about craft scissors. Has anyone tried Tim Holtz scissors? Are they worth the money? I think he's, doesn't he have a couple different kinds though? He has the rubber kind. I guess I've only seen the, the like the bigger to the tonic ones that are like 17 And they're for rubber. They're for they're like they're the cutting rubber scissors. and more kind of crafty, yeah, heavier duty kind of cutting yep. in plastic and that kind of stuff, but I guess I haven't seen. Well, maybe that's all he has. Cause I wonder. I was wondering if he had maybe some micro tip scissors. You would or think that he would, but I yeah. don't remember seeing in our stores. But we're kind of the last. Well, well last stop. We don't have blood. it that bad. I see some comments from people that cannot oh, get anything. That's true. So we, that's true. we have nothing I to really complain about. Complain about. Um, there's no one perfect scissors for everything. I mean, you would know that. You've got. You need scissors for fabric. I have gobs and gobs of them. Yeah, you need scissors for paper. Like especially like a micro tip scissors, something that you can really cut around detailed paperwork. And um, you need paper, you need scissors that are industrial, like for cutting out your rubber stamps, your unmounted rubber stamps. So I think his stamps are uh, his scissors are nonstick, heavy duty scissors. Yeah, and and I have heard great things about them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know a few people that are you know the bigger names that have been around for years mm -hmm. that that's what they have on their table or when yep. they're doing their video. Like Heidi Swap uses those. Yeah. And and they are expensive, but I know that there are places where you can use those 40% coupons. That's right. That's right. So then not too, too bad. If yeah. And I mean, uh, my KAI scissors that I got for cutting, because I buy mostly unmounted stamps, so I have to trim rubber all the time. Um, I mean, those are 20 bucks. It's not like it's outrageous. Good, good scissors yeah. that are expensive will pay for themselves. Yeah. You know, like I have dressmaking shears that cost like forty five dollars, mm -hmm. and I've had them for years and years and years. So. Yeah, and they last. Oh, and I have to send a shout out to Brent. Thank you for the scissors. They haven't arrived yet, but uh, he's oh, sending no, me some scissors. Really? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you in advance. <laughs> cool. I thought that was awfully cute. All right, the junk junkie. I'm finally getting around to setting up a watercolor palette and wonder what is the best way to put the paints in the pan. Like color order, I want to start with my student grade paints to use them up while I'm learning. Use what you have. <laughs> Where does that quote come from? <laughs> um, I was looking for a warm and cool shade of each color too. Tell me please, am I going in the right direction? Can you make any suggestions? 
One last thing. Some of the paint in the tubes are kind of thick, hard. Can they be used or should I toss them? I have a set of portfolio paints and the first tube I open smells funny. However, they do say non-toxic. Hmm, these paints are mostly hand-me-downs, thanks. All right, so uh, here's my main watercolor palette. I don't use this in tutorials too much because it takes up too much space in my desk, but I generally like to go in um, a color wheel order. Uh, and so I have, they actually have, a, there's a palette called the Quiller palette, which is actually done in the circle. It's meant for putting your stuff in color wheel order. But so like, um, I got my cool reds over here, my warmer reds towards orange over here. Um, I've got, you know, my greeny, my greener, cooler blues over towards green, my warmer blues and purples over towards the red. So I just have mine kind of in the way, like a color wheel would go, and then I just kind of get my browns and neutrals all together on one side. That works for me. It makes sense that my warmer reds are near my oranges and yellows. Well, they're kind of opposite because I had to get my neutrals in there, but that just helps me when I'm mixing. I know that if I use this blue, I'm going to get a more vibrant purple than if I use this blue over here. That would give me a duller purple because it's, you know, further away from purple on the color wheel. So that's how I do that. You can absolutely use those paints that have gotten dry. You can actually, I've had um, watercolors that have hardened in the tube and I've just cut the tube away and um. I've plopped that I think right here, maybe, right? If you look at that one right there, yeah. that would that got dried in the uh, in the container, so I just mm -hmm. cut the container, cut the tube right off, and plopped it right in there, and squirted it, squirted it with some water, and, and good as new. So yes, absolutely, they they don't go bad unless they get moldy, but that usually doesn't happen. As for weird smelling paint, I'm sure it's fine. Portfolio, the the Crayola line is non toxic, you, you know, and not all watercolor is tox is non toxic because they are they are pigments and. Um, some pigments come from cadmium, cobalt. I've got cadmium, cobalt, um, nickel on my palette. So that's another reason. I don't leave that out where my kids are going to use it because I don't want them to, you know, be painting and accidentally dip the brush in their drink and, you know, mm -hmm. end up getting that chemical in there. Uh, so I really wouldn't worry about toxicity, especially you're an adult, you're not eating your paints, um, but por the portfolio line should be fine. It might just smell funny because of some of the um, binders or fillers that are in the portfolio paints. I always notice the kids... Um, Materials must smell a little sweeter. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why. It must be one of the waxes or something we use. <clears throat> oh, and and if you're not too familiar with exactly what the color wheel looks like, I'm sure any kind of search will call yeah. it up and show yeah. you, so you can have something to look at when you're setting it up. Yeah, just look at the color. You'll be able to tell if a if a red is more pink or if a red is more orange. So basically, if you look at a color wheel, like uh, the warmer colors would lean more towards red or yellow. The cooler colors would lean more towards blue or green. So. Yeah. Carmen wants to buy weird and modern stamps. Any ideas? All right. Well, she mentions the Lost Coast Designs. They have a lot of weird and modern stamps. They do. Um, Viva Las Vegas stamps has some real <laughs> weird ones. Yeah. Uh, and and, so and, and a few distasteful ones, but they're a riot. <laughs> uh, who are us to, who are we to judge? Um, there's a great stamp company that... Um, it went out of business, but then the stamp line was bought. It was ca it's called uh, the Museum of Modern Rubber, and that that has some really cool stuff, I like etch a sketch stamps and um, cool. like laptops that open up and cell phones that open up and just some like and some snow globes and just some kind of funky cool stuff. Um, Starving Art Stamps has some kind of cool mm -hmm. weird ones. Uh, I don't know. I think uh, I think Viva Las Vegas stamps and Lost Coast Designs are yeah yeah are gonna some real and, and, different ones. And you know that too much fun is yeah, kind yeah. of weird and different because they're more interactive. Like they have yes. sweatshirts and jackets that you can put zippers in and shopping bags with the little little things that go with it to put mm -hmm. in it and, and like the four folded up. Oh, the pedal like, the envelopes, pedal yeah. With yep. different tops and um, not not necessarily un weird, but just kind of different mm -hmm. and, yep. and more interactive. Worth checking out. Yeah. Hannah Lee, I wonder what are some fun ways to use water brushes? Uh, I generally just use my water brushes if I'm painting like at a crop or out and about. Um, I just fill it with water and use it as a regular brush. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm at home, I actually prefer a bucket and water. So I mean, that's some people fill their water brushes with colored ink, like in colored paint, and will use it like that. Or they'll put like glycerin in it and make their own glycerin and water, make their own like embossing pen. There's a few ideas for you. Okay, Nancy Martinez wants to know where to find stamp shows. If you go to um, Rubber Stamp Madness, which is a magazine, they have a website online, uh, they have a whole convention list, and you can find the conventions all over the uh, all over the country. Um, we have a couple more questions. I am going to do them, but we'll be, uh, we got to let the camera flip over to a new file. So we'll be back in a minute with a couple more questions, so stick around. 
Hi, we're back. Hi, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's the next question? Cedarbug asks, is there a cheap alternative to Inca Gold paste paint? Um, you know, I haven't used that. Have you used that, Kathy? I haven't. And I know the Viva company, I think they went out of business. Um, so you may be able to find it on clearance at like Hobby Lobby and uh, different stores online. I'm trying to unload the inventory, so you might want to first look and see if you can find it for like a buck or two a jar. Um, other than that, there's a product called Rub and Buff, which is a um, uh, like a paste gold paint. I think they have it in different metallic sheens. It's for frame makers have used it, and it's the same thing. You you rub it on, then you polish it off, and you get that shiny gold finish. Um, and you might even try to make your own with like some, I don't know, maybe some like uh, beeswax and and some prolex or some eyeshadow. You might try that. Mm -hmm. And there's always acrylic paint, which you know might just do fine for what you want to do. Acrylic metallic paint. That's very cheap. That's like and, a bucket too. And that that's come a long way. Mm -hmm. Like the metallic paint. Yes. Yeah, I think it's the folk art makes a nice one. I think it's like seventy seven cents a tube at Walmart. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, and Marion has two questions. Do you have a video explaining when and what types of watercolors are for used in different types of art? Um, what color pencils versus watercolor pans versus watercolor crayons versus watercolor tubes of paint? And do you want to do that? Okay, let me do? Um, I think I will actually do a video on that. I don't have a, a video where I'm comparing everything, but I think mm -hmm. that might be a very interesting video yeah, to do. Yeah, we get so. a lot of questions, you know, not necessarily yeah. all for each. Yeah, I think I'll do, I think we'll do a video just comparing and contrasting, so, and that way people that haven't tried any can, you know, decide. And talk about different papers yeah. for each. And I think that's, that's yes. good, would be great. Yeah, put that on the list. Um, and the second question, I have a picture, a poster that was professionally framed years ago, double matted behind glass, etc. I'm over the picture inside and the mats aren't colors that match my style anymore. I plan to paint the frame, but what can I do with the mats to update the look for my next piece of art? I stick in there. Thanks in advance. Um, okay, so she plans on painting the frame. That's, a, that's great. Uh, for the mats, something you could do is you could rubber stamp on them. You could even paint the mats. Just try to keep paint off the bevel, the little the little edge, the little yeah. around the frame. Um, stamping works great. Something I have done before that looks really pretty if it's a light color. Actually, you could do it even if it's a dark color. Uh, stamp with glycerin or clear embossing ink all over it and then just use um, chalk pastels and a cotton ball to tap. Take the cotton ball, rub it on the pastel and just tap the uh, chalk on your design and you'll get a really soft, pretty mm -hmm. uh, kind of tapestry look on your mats. Um, and then you'll want to spray it with a little sealer or it's going to stick to your glass when you, um, you know, it could rub off when you put it back in the frame. But yeah, paint, stamp, whatever you want. There's also fun finished paints like uh, crackle and stone and, you know, really, you could do anything to that. You could put anything on those mats that you could paint on paper, really, or canvas. So I wouldn't do oil because it, it would probably sink in and probably get oil stains because it's just paper, it's untreated. But any sort of uh, water media or dry media like a, like a pastel would be good on that. And um, I did have, actually, you want to read that question? That's that last one. It just came in. I was checking my email right before I came down, and I thought this was a really good question. Okay, Ida May says, Hi, Lindsay. You are so much fun. I had a stamp and scrapbooking store about 15 years ago. I am missing those days. Oh, I so, am. So are we. We are, too. <laughs> I was thinking about becoming a Stampin' Up! demonstrator, but wondered if I could do more on my own. I want to have camp days, but I'm wondering about how to make money. Thank you for any advice that you would have. To me. All right. Well, it seems like every February we have this discussion about, <laughs> oh, should we become Stampin' Up! demonstrators? Wouldn't that be fun? Um, the, the, the profit that you can make as a Stampin' Up! I'm not a Stampin' Up! demonstrator, and I'm sure there are people that watch that are, that if they are willing to give you advice, then then maybe just leave a comment last week on her on the, her comment last week if you want to just say, hey, I'm a Stampin' Up! demonstrator. You get any questions? Because I know they people can sign up other people under them and they help right. them along the way. So you do have support that way. Um, I think I think what you make is 30% of your sales. I think that's your, your profit, right? 30%? I, I'm not so I'm not positive, but that sounds about right. It's yeah. twenty to thirty percent, but I think I think okay. it's thirty. Okay, so that's what you're gonna make. So, but in a general, in a in a traditional retail situation, you'd make fifty percent. Um, like you would mark it up double. So you know you've got that. But then again, you don't have to carry inventory, so you don't have that unsold inventory to worry about. So whatever you sell, you're automatically getting, you know, twenty yeah. to thirty percent. And you, and you don't have to keep or store inventory. Yes. Yeah. And, probably insure it and all yeah. of that that goes with it. Yeah, the downside is that, um, you know, you've got to always be hustling and drumming up 
parties and drumming up business and you know getting getting orders rather if you have something right there somebody could just hand you the cash and take the product which is you know which is a little bit of um might be a consideration for someone to place an order um as far as like camps and stuff, I know there's like a Stampin' Up! lady that Lorraine's friends with that does like weekly card classes and she seems to do a pretty good business. Um, I think though, you could probably make more money teaching classes using whatever supplies and you probably could as a Stampin' Up! demonstrator. You know, if you had a space like maybe in the church or in a local library or school, if you had a little, or maybe in your home studio, if you could offer classes and people could bring their supplies, use your supplies and you would get a class fee, I think you'd probably make a little bit more money that way. Um, Most definitely. Yeah, because then you wouldn't have to worry about inventory and um, all the paperwork and stuff that goes along with that. And and you also wouldn't have the limitations that come with the Stampin' Up! demonstrator, yeah. as in, you know, not really using mm -hmm. other products from other lines for, you yeah. know, your, your, um, your, pro pro your pro projects. projects. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, I could, that's, that's, that's what stops me, is like... I have so much Being stuff, limited, and I yeah. want to use all this stuff. I want to use all these different products from all these different companies. I can't just settle down and pick one company to, to you know, use products from. I use products from everywhere, and and Stampin' Up! stuff is high. You know, I uh, that said, all the Stampin' Up! stuff I, I have bought, I use a lot, and I think it's because I think and about I, the I, purchase I, a lot right, more. Right. You know, I'm not if I'm buying a $20 stamp set, I'm going to make sure I'm going to use it a lot rather than, oh, look, $2 stamp set in the bargain bin. You don't even think about that. You throw it in your cart, and you... You never use it, and you know, but you really think about those more expensive purchases. And I don't know. I bet you have the clientele. If you used to have a stamp store, you probably know a lot of the people that. Which which would um, help to be on your own, and also help to yeah. be a demonstrator. Mm -hmm. So that's to your advantage. But probably you know to go on your own, that would definitely that you have some kind of contacts and network. Yeah, maybe if you contacted like your local school, your local church, um, see if you could use space to do like or a monthly the crop. Senior, the senior, senior, senior centers. Um, see if you can get like a crop going or maybe classes. If you could get a crop and you could get a space and charge everybody a couple of bucks to come and like split the take with the the place where you're having it, yep. then you know you could get a feel for what sort of interest there is. Um, that said, I've been to quite a few crops where there hasn't been very many people. It's you know, I, I think it really comes down to how, how aggressive you are promoting it and marketing it, if you're going to get the word out. Because um, if you're willing to do those things, you know, you can be successful. you just got to find the find the market and get people back into the hobby that haven't been doing it for a while. Right. If it's scrapbooking. I feel like I've probably just confused this poor woman more than, no, more than anything. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. The real money's in the YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, now I feel like I've totally confused her. Um, but, I, you know... It wouldn't hurt to try having a class and see, you know, you can always teach through adult ed. I don't think the profit margin's high there, but at least it would give you uh, exposure to different... A, a feel for it. Yeah, yeah. and you can yeah. see if you liked it. And rec, all the, like, your, your town rec department probably has, you know, budget or need for adult programs like that. Um, you can go, uh, a lot of times, Girl Scout troops and Boy Scout troops need... Um, you know, crafters and artists to help the kids get their badges, like to do to a lesson for them. Things. And, yeah. you know, just yeah. a, and volunteer opportunities like that can introduce you to some really great um, a customer base, such as like, you know, all the parents of the scouts might be willing to take a scrapbooking class if they see you demonstrating this sort of thing to their kids. So, you know, just kind of think of that, think of those volunteering opportunities as marketing opportunities. And, you know, so you basically just need to have customers and you need to have something that people want. So whether that be the service of your class or the products that you would sell as a Stampin' Up! demonstrator or Close to My Heart demonstrator or whatever, you know, company really speaks to you. Yeah, just uh, just got to get yourself out there and... Yeah, and, and like you said, you know, try try to do try to do a class on your own, but mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, there's no harm in talking to a Stampin' Up! Yeah. demonstrator and or a Close to My High demonstrator and yeah. find out more about it or what the deal is, because I think, mm -hmm. I think ultimately you're almost always under somebody, yeah. and so you would have that support where yeah. on your own you, you wouldn't really. But right, exactly. So they have formulas and stuff. How, how, how much you want to yeah. put into it. And, yeah. And I think the people that do really, that are really successful and like stamping up, get a good downline. They get a lot of people underneath them. And so I think they're making a percentage of their sales as well. So it is, I hate to say pyramid marketing because it has such negative connotations, but I think it is somewhat of a pyramid marketing yeah. uh, layout yeah. where you get, you're under somebody, but you try to get people under you too. And as, and you inspire them and as they become successful, you get uh, some of that back. So uh, I think the people that really make a living doing that are aggressive in, in pulling people underneath them and 
um, and building their business that way. And then the, you know, the fun, the parties are fun and it's a great way to get your name yeah, out there. Take, and taking and, every advantage of what the yeah. company offers as far yeah. as training and all yeah. that too. So, yeah. Yeah. Lorraine was telling me her friend just, uh, just started it like six months ago or something. And she went to Salt Lake city to the big, uh, the big, yeah, was, uh, powwow out there. I, I, yeah. I think so it would fun. be it's, fun. It's just a limiting. It's just a, the being is, limited yeah. to just those products, which would, would give, I would have a hard time with that because no, it's, it's wonderful product, yeah. but mm -hmm. still there's so many other wonderful products yep. out there and I think to to keep the whole the whole business alive it's good to support them all and yep. not and I think there's other companies that do like the direct sales but do other companies as well so um, if there's anybody out there that's working at all in like the direct marketing uh, direct sales in a craft uh, what do you genre. Want to say? genre if you want to go to last week's um, uh, video and leave her comment and if you don't mind being contacted that will probably help her out an awful lot because I've never done it I think it looks like a ball it would be fun but I've never done it myself so hopefully that'll help you and give you some resources on uh, where to go and and that's item A if you're so you can flip through yeah, item a. and find, find it, it yeah um, if you go to ask a crap I'm sorry. <laughs> if you go to Ask a Crafter 38 and you click uh, the comments newest first, hers is going to be right at the top because she, I mean, seriously, like 25 minutes ago or something left that comment. Uh, so there we go. Well, there, an extra long show. Thanks to my new computer that can <laughs> handle video. <laughs> it doesn't like chug along for three days. Um, get your questions in for next week. I'll probably do a long one next week too because it's I'll want to. It's going to be the last one for months. Until oh, fall. and we'll have like to talk Goodies. about the stamp show. Yes, we'll talk about the stamp show, heirloom stamp show at the Big E in West Springfield, Massachusetts next weekend. We will be there on Saturday, and I, if you do see us, please come over and say hello. And um, that would be awesome. That would be fun. Yes. We recognize. Most definitely. It will be. <laughs> there could be tens of people there that know us. <laughs> All right, guys. And, thank and we accept donations. <laughs> Yeah, I gotta, gotta pay for those stamps somehow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks so much for watching. Please thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I imagine anybody that's here this long is already a subscriber. <laughs> I don't think people just wander into this and stay all the whole time. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And until next time, happy crafting. Bye.